Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. We continue with our discussion on trans, uh, traditions in world cinema and today we are going to focus on Chinese cinema, rather what is transnational Chinese cinema. You understand what is transnational happening across the nation. So, we are talking not just about Chinese cinema uh, and uh, in China, but how it, ha it is leaving a kind of uh, impact globally. Now, Chinese cinema is a force in, wor uh, in world cinema and that is in the era of globalization, that is what we are going to talk about. We are going to talk about the crossover and subtitle Chinese cinema and as we know transnational cinema is that which is subtitle, which is more, uh, which is made basically for globalized rather than local uh, uh, audiences. And then we will also talk about the uh, pivotal move, uh, moments or movements in Chinese transnational cinema, for example, Hong Kong action films, art house films and also wuxia films. We will also talk about the major authors, the directors and actors of tra uh, Chinese transnational cinema. A brief background on Chinese cinema, the early Chinese film industry thrived in Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s, first in the form of supernatural martial arts and then in left wing realist melodramas dealing with social issues and patriotism. These two tendencies reflect different attitudes to the modern. The former was a magical popular belief in science, the latter uh, uh, a rationalist belief in and political movements whose ad, uh, adherents saw the supernatural as a feudal quality, a feudal aspect. During the 1930s, the government banned the supernatural martial arts films along with dialect cinema, the cinema which was not in the national language. Now, this shifted the, these bans and certain political policies, they shifted martial arts and Cantonese cinema to Hong Kong. So, you have mainland China, you have Hong Kong island. So, we are talking about cinema in Hong Kong and Shanghai this at this period, during this period was occupied during, um, uh, during the 1937 to 45 war of resistance against Japan. So, a second golden age developed in Shanghai after the war. The establishment of the People's Republic in 1949 was followed by the nationalization of the film industry. The government treated cinema as a vehicle of propaganda while controlling the industry, it also established new studios throughout the country and brought cinema to the masses. A shift from social realism to socialist realism resulted in increased thematic changes. Where pre-revolutionary films had raised issues without offering solutions, post-revolutionary films preferred heroes from the approved worker, farmer, soldier classes and happy endings in uh, which the communist party aided their success. However, there were exceptions. Possibly the most famous post revolutionary filmmaker Zia Jin include uh, his films includes films about sports heroines and opera and in his repertoire. Few cinemas have impacted contemporary popular culture as deeply as the Hong Kong action film cinema. Since the 1970s, the genre has been a staple in cinema theatres on television and on video. Martial arts, uh, martial arts stars such as Jackie Chan, all of us here I am sure are admirers of Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, Jet Li, they are household names idolized by the masses and the films are remade even in uh, a number of Indian uh, languages cinema with major stars. Now, one of the first films of this uh, martial arts category was Enter the Dragon with the martial arts expert trio of um, John Saxon, Bruce Lee and Jim Kelly. The film was produced by Warner Brothers 
and it struck an immediate chord with the Indian film goers also largely because of its entertainment value, spectacular action and of course, the famous Bruce Lee charisma. The plot is centered on the machinations of a cunning crime lord Mr. Han who stages annual martial arts tournament on an island. The film was dubbed in every possible regional language in India and is spawned of several cinematic imitations. So, the proliferation of martial arts schools, t-shirts and posters bearing the figure of uh, Bruce Lee played a major role for thousands of young men in India in learning what it means to be a man in contemporary society. Bruce Lee's brand of cinema uh, influenced a generation of Indian film actors and we have examples from all over. For example, we uh, uh, in during uh, the 70s and the early 80s, we had Mithun Chakravarti who would often um, you know star in film that were like echoes of the Bruce Lee persona. Now, we will talk about more art house kind of films and Chinese uh, of Chinese cinema, especially uh, the fact that we are talking about transnational globalized cinema in contemporary times. So, um, we have we have something called the fifth generation of cinema and these uh, of Chinese cinema which came to uh, global attention with Yellow Earth which was made in 1984 and it was shot by uh, someone called Zhang Yimou. Now, he start I am saying someone called because he started off as a cinematographer, but then went on to become a major a really renowned figure in world cinema. Zhang Yimou then moved into direction with something called Red Sorghum which was public uh, which was re uh, released in 1987. The first post graduation fifth generation film was 1 and 8 directed by Zhang um, Zhongzhou and also shot by Zhang Yimou, but when Yellow Earth screened at, at the 1985 Hong Kong International Film Festival, people sat up and took notice because it was so different from the films that had been coming out of the People's Republic of China before. So, while the 70s witnessed violence as manly, danger as exciting and toughness as emotional self control with globalization and in the late 1960s, India also along with the rest of the world awakened to the films outside the genre of conventional Kung Fu from China. Again, I am talking about how Chinese cinema has crossed boundaries over the decades. So, one of the early films in this category was Ringo Lam's City on Fire, which in a many ways started the trend of aesthetics in action. I am giving you a term which has been used by the great film scholar expert David Bordwell, who uses this term aesthetics in action. It, uh, this uh, movie City on Fire was remade as Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs, which is an international cult classic. City on, inspire, uh, on Fire also inspired a Hindi film Kante. Uh, the film had a stellar cast and it capitalized on the theme of honor among thieves, masculine pride and friendship among men. Now, some of the international Chinese stars or filmmakers that I am sure most of us are familiar with, um, they are Jet Li, Jackie Chan and also we have uh, uh, art house actors such as Tony Lang and Maggie Chang. We have John Wu from China who has become a truly uh, global icon and as well as Ang Lee and more art house kind of directors Zhang Yimou and Wong Kar Wai. We will be referring to their films. Now, uh, before I start let me talk about wuxia. This is a, a genre in fiction in Chinese fiction and how it has become so popular in contemporary Chinese cinema also. Now, uh, wuxia is a genre of traditional Chinese martial arts. Wu stands for martial arts and a war and military virus. Shia is a type of protagonist found in wuxia fiction, a synonym for chivalry. The constraints of everyday reality nature do not apply in wuxia films. Warriors in wuxia films are able to fly through the air, run up walls, 
shoot balls of mystical energy. Um, we have example of Zhang Yimou, who is who I just told you. He was the first, uh, he belongs to the fifth generation of Chinese filmmakers trained in Beijing Film Academy and made his debut in 1987 with Red Sogam, a critically acclaimed film. He also made uh, several uh, uh, films which we are going to talk about, but most importantly and uh, his one of the most important and um, well loved film by Zhang Yimou was his 2002 hero starring Tony Lang, Maggie Chang, Donnie Yen and of course, Jet Li. It is one of the most successful indigenously produced Chinese films and what it was distributed by Tarantino in North America. It was marketed as Jet Li's hero obviously, because Jet Li was one of the most well known figures okay, uh, actors in this film. The style is wuxia, uh, it is also historiography which is telling retelling a certain aspect of Chinese history, okay, but in a fictionalized way. The story is told in terms of color codings with cinematography by Christopher Doyle. Um, and it also uh, has a Rashomon kind of narrative structure, where a story is told through several versions. Um, we have the Jet Li, who plays a character called Nameless and his version, where he, where the director used psychological methods to discover weak points of uh, the person who is his interlocutor. Okay. Um, in hero, martial arts genre transcends action and violence and moves into sheer poetry, ballet and philosophy and makes a great use of symbolism and imagery. We will talk about Ang Lee, who was trained in the US film industry. He has successfully collaborated with American screenwriters such as James Shamos. With his diverse trans, uh, transnational um, filmography, Ang Lee has established himself as the most versatile and commercially successful filmmaker of the new Taiwanese cinema, cinema uh, or cinematic filmmaker. Alongside Stan Lai and Sai Ming Liang works, Lee's films can be categorized into a second wave of new Taiwanese cinema characterized by fluid identities and urban sensibilities. This is necessary for understanding Lee's exploration of personal identities such as sexuality, gender, generations within a transnational Chinese framework and within other cultural and historical contexts of displacement and social change. Since the international success of his The Wedding Banquet, which was made in 93, Lee's career has been characterized by different types of border crossing. Lee's career was launched by a trilogy of Taiwanese American family comedy dramas such as Pushing Hands, The Wedding Banquet and Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, one of his most cherished films. Subsequently, Lee directed four uh, period films, literary adaptations from diverse cultural and historical settings and you have to look at Ang Lee's versatility here. He adapted Jane Austen's England in Sense and Sensibility, uh, the American Suburbia 90 of 1970s in The Ice Storm, the American Civil War in Ride with the Devil in 98 and early 20th, early 19th century China in Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon, which was uh, such a massive international success released in 1999. Lee also directed a gangster film, The Hire chosen in 2001 and the comic book adaptation Hulk in 2003 and later on he made uh, uh, his controversial western set in the 1970s Brokeback Mountain, which is about homosexuality and gender identities in 2005, which was released in 2005. Now, Lee, Lee's versatility places him in the distinguished character uh, category of Asian directors alongside um, Zhang Yimou and Wong Kar Wai and also Takeshi Kitano. It is interesting to note how Lee has specialized in popular genres films, something that has won him audiences in Asia, North America and Europe. 
one of the key aspects of his works that fascinates that you will all find extremely fascinating is how a Taiwanese has moved in from telling family stories such as eat drink man woman to the world of Jane Austen and to the world of the westerns and he has been universally praised for his achievements and his the way he has successfully established himself on the global forum. You consider Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon and the wild action scenes, they lend a touch of an escapist fantasy and magic realism. I strongly recommend that you watch if you have in Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon. And at the heart of the film is a coming of age tale. It is the girl's story, it is a told through the perspective of a young girl on the verge of womanhood. And parallel stories are there, love stories, revenge um, stories of a uh, theme of betrayal, but at the heart it is a coming of age uh, story and perhaps that is what found resonance among the global audience. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is also noted for the way it tackles gender representation where there is always masculine, feminine and vice versa. Uh, coming back to Brokeback Mountain, he uh, Lee won the Academy Award for Best Direction and which is you know a great acceptance of uh, uh, a foreigner in the mainstream cinema, mainstream global cinema. He also has directed very successfully Lust Caution, which won the Global Lion at Venice and Taking Woodstock in 2009. His most recent success is of course, Life of Pi, which is based on Yann Martel's 2001 novel. The film was as you all know was a critical and commercial success and won 11 Academy Awards including Best Director for Lee. Lee's work illustrates the inevitable conflicts and negotiations between individuals bound by familial and societal obligations. Lee's films now consistently negotiate among cultures, nations, generations and genders, illustrating the repressive as well as revitalizing forces of Chinese traditions in the intersections of the residual past and emerging future. The next director that uh, I would like to draw your attention to is Wong Kar Wai, uh, who has famously made Days of Being Wild, Chunking Express, Ashes of Time, Happy Together in the Mood for Love and My Blueberry Nights. Now, Chunking Express is uh, one of his most beloved films, most cherished films of all. Um, if this means anything to you, then Tarantino is a huge fan of Chunking Express, okay, but that is an aside. So, Chunking Express is an interrogation of cultural authenticity and critiques the Americanization of local conditions in contemporary Hong Kong. It operates as a study of masculine anguish and Hong Kong's post colonial urban culture of movement, look, dislocation and transition. You have to watch the film and you have to watch its you have to pay attention to its soundtrack and you will understand how important this film is uh, if you look at uh, the movie as a postmodernist text in global times. Another Im uh, important film, film of his is Fallen Angels in 1995, which is about love and desire that must be the tagline it is about love and unfulfilled desires. It was originally intended to be the third story in Chunking Express, but then he decided to make it into an independent film. And uh, uh, here, uh, that protagonist struggle with the notion of a dual identity, you know, Hong Kong mainland China, Hong Kong versus mainland China. And um, the film actually, the characters aspire to create a more localized identity, and the mood is very distinctive. As in all Wong Kar Wai films, there is an atmosphere, a pastiche of colors and emotions. You have to know that Chinese cinema, contemporary cinema is known for its uh, expressive colors, expressiveness of colors. Some of you would be interested. If you are interested in these things, mise en scene 
uh, and colors and light um, lights then you need to watch Wong Kar Wai's films also Zhang Yimou's films. So, Fallen Angels is a, a fractured tale a fractured narrative of uh, an unconsummated love between a hired a professional killer and his female partner. It is very elusive, it has a very elliptic style, but that is the beauty of it. Uh, Roger Ebert the great the late great film critic, he says that it will appeal to the kinds of people you see in the Japanese animation section of the video store uh, with their sleeves cut off. So, you can see their tattoos and to those who subscribe to more than three film magazines that is the intellectual types, the grunge types and then and to members of garage bands and to art students. It is not for your average movie goers. So, you know it comes with a uh, with a disclaimer that it is not for uh, everyone, but nevertheless it is a highly enjoyable film if you are seriously into world cinema. We will talk about John Wu and his brand of heroic bloodshed. This is a term coined by British journalist Rick Baker, heroic bloodshed and John Wu. He is known for his films such as Better Tomorrow, A Better Tomorrow, Hard Boil, The Killer and A Bullet in the Head. Also Hard Target, Face Off, Broken Arrow and Mi2 as well as Paycheck, his more uh, recent and his Hollywood films. Wu's films are characterized by social chaos, apocalyptic feelings following the Tiananmen Square massacre and his and its consequences was for Hong Kong in 1997. Okay, so, um, you have several spectacular action sin scenes in Wu's films. If you are the type, please watch John Wu's cinema, highly entertaining, less art house as compared to Wong Kar Wai. So, uh, where does all this lead us to? So, Ang Lee and Zhang Yimou they are more like exoticized um, uh, filmmakers, but still doing extremely well with their brand of cinema. Um, in the global scenario you have John Wu known for his heroic bloodshed and of course, he is a very successful very mainstream kind of a film director. He has made several uh, blockbusters in Hollywood, then you have Wong Kar Wai and Sui Hak, more postmodernist, their films are um, more hybrid and fragmented uh, kinds of narratives. There is no single cinema that is national cinema, the, but Chinese cinema at this moment has several national cinemas. The sixth generation that took off in the 1970s, but it had an uphill task of distinguishing itself from the fifth gen, uh, generation in the aftermath of Tiananmen heights of censorship. Some gave up and went straight from uh, the film academies into the ma ma mainstream industry, while others went underground. This means not submitting film for censorship prior to distribution and exhibitions inside China. This leads to low budget and dependence on income from overseas. After making uh, the first film a drama about difficulties of disabled children in China, which is Mama. Uh, for example, a filmmaker like Zhang Yuan went underground with the Beijing Bastards, a film about the rock scenario, rock scene, uh, rock music in Beijing. This was followed by the documentary about everyday life in uh, Tiananmen Square called the Square, which was co-directed with Duan Xinchuan and a feature about gay life in Beijing called East Palace, West Palace, which was made in 1996. The fifth generation favored exotic locales on the borders of the country. They focused on history and high style. In contrast, almost all the sixth generation films emphasize on urban youth, contemporary life and naturalistic realism, bordering on documentary, a mode many of them are dabbling in. However, the underground mode of production was not economically and uh, politically viable since the millennium the sixth generation have uh, been attempting to join the mainstream looking for investment and the domestic market. Some have found modest box office successes, but few have won critical success for their efforts so far. So, the eyes of critics today are on the newest filmmakers 
who no one has designated as a generation yet. In China, there is a culture of calling filmmakers uh, according to the generation. So, so far we do not have a generation, but Chinese cinema something that is very well established and Chinese cinema filmmakers of the future are someone to watch out for. So, this is one more addition in our talk on traditions in global cinema or world cinema. We will continue this with uh, more discussions on world cinema in our subsequent classes. Thank you very much.